19th century was dominated by war with France and Holland, so being close to the Channel and the North Sea meant that Chatham on the River Medway was an ideal place for the Royal Navy to base and build its fleet. Chatham Royal Dockyard was the principal shipbuilding yard for the Royal Navy, and between 1700 and 1815, 125 ships were built and launched here, providing work for nearly 2,000 men from 26 different trades. Many of the Georgian buildings are still here, a reminder that this was once the most important dockyard in Britain. One building that's remained in constant use throughout the dockyard's 400-year history is the ropery. Sail ships like Admiral Nelson's HMS Victory, which was built and launched here, required 20 miles of rope for its rigging alone. The rope walk stretches nearly a quarter of a mile, and with such a distance, using a bike makes life a lot easier. Okay, the bikes are a new addition, but the rope is full of the original Victorian machinery. And back then, it was a sweaty, noisy, exhausting business. And these days, Chatham rope makers are still making rope commercially, and they're the only ones in the world using these traditional techniques. In 1984, the dockyard closed and is now a museum welcoming visitors from all over the country. So, it's time to raise the roadshow anchor and set sail as we join our specialists and residents of the nearby Medway towns. And for you land lovers watching at home, you can play along with our valuation game. Just press red on your remote control or go to bbc.co.uk slash antiques roadshow on your computer or on your smartphone. Now, I always think that the best paintings of sailors and the sea are by sailors first and artists second. Yes. And here is one, William Lionel Wiley. And uh, he was a local man, wasn't he? I believe he was, yes. He did work here in the, in the Midway and also the Thames, and then he moved to Portsmouth, I believe. Yes, I think that's right. And uh, is, that, uh, is that not recognisable as Rochester Castle? Rochester Castle. And so right over there, yes. I think I'm right in saying. Yes, and that is uh, one of quarries being unloaded by uh, hand, coal. So, so it's coal being lifted out of the holes yes. by these, uh, these four... Were yes. they Steve doors or...? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hauling it out, and there's a fellow here, I rather like him, he's, he's, he's shouting, isn't he? I yes. don't know what he's doing. Is that a mug of beer? Could that be? Yes. So he's having a jolly good old drink yeah. and a shout. And uh, it's such a bustle, such a lively scene, and you really do get a strong sense of... Uh, and when would it be about, do you think? About um, early 1900s. That's what I think, yes. Or, or perhaps even earlier, yes. actually. And here are the barges they're loading the coal into. Yes. And, and the smoke and the steam, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's very uh, evocative of the busy life that this place yeah. must have once had. Yeah, oh, it. yes. Um, when you think of what it used to be like the Midway years ago, even in my time, it's altered so much. Uh, some because your, your job is on the river. It was on the river, yes. Right. I was skipper of a salvage vessel, Medway Rhino, the voyage and salvage vessel, based at Shannon's Docks. And what were your duties? Uh, all the boys in the Medway and ten parts of the Thames Estuary. And so also... here am I telling you, 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 you must understand the river better than me, far better. So, I mean, is that, would you say that's a fair representation of river life? Yes, I'll, I've actually gone round there and got an idea of where it's where he actually took it from and that was uh, right on the corner of uh, what we call Chatham Ness. And there's a poem on the back. That is uh, a poem from a burial at sea when you do uh, an ashes at sea. Have you had to do those? I have done it yes. Um, How does the poem go? It is my sole relief that on some far distant shore far from despair and grief old friends shall meet once more. I think that's great, and it obviously means a great deal to you. It's a nice feeling. You know, if you're doing a, someone's ashes, you know, a colleague's ashes at sea um, in the Medway or in the Thames Estuary, um, it's nice to be able to do something, you know. I think that's great. Now, I think it was probably done for one of the magazines, like the graphic or something. It's an illustration, it seems to me. Yeah. It's actually done in watercolour, in one colour, which is, again, it adds to the immediacy. I get the feeling of him standing right there and doing it, just dashing it off, catching it like a snapshot yeah. for an instant, and that's why it feels so real, so immediate, yeah. and, uh, and so very good. Um, how did you get it? Uh, I rescued it from being burnt. Oh, no. 
Yes. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. Uh, they was clearing out uh, some of the offices. And this was and, ages ago? Or, uh, uh, 40 years ago. Oh, I see, yes. And um, I managed to rescue this one. Well, now, I mean, he's a very sought-after artist. I mean, he actually ran away to sea because the Royal Academy rejected some of his pictures. He thought, yes. forget that, I'm going to sea. And that's, of course, where he learned uh, a great deal more about the sea than he, than he had known. And that's why he came back the better marine artist, I think, yeah. uh, later on. And he is collected. Uh, and I, I particularly like his work, I must say. So I'm delighted to find one. Um, I can't put a huge amount on it simply because it is black and white. No. But I would have thought, I'd be surprised if it wasn't worth four to six hundred pounds. Yeah. Something like that. OK, well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for bringing it. So where exactly did this piece of furniture come from? Uh, it came from Hampton Court Palace. That's a good provenance? Uh, yeah. How do you know it came from Hampton Court? My aunt had a, a, a wet fish shop in Hampton and um, she supplied the palace with fish. And right. uh, she would take fresh fish to the palace every day. And this cupboard stood in one of the back passages of the palace. She liked it. She thought it was unloved. She used to have a joke with the people there that she delivered the fish to for years. This is sometime just after the war. And um, one day when she went in, they said um, that she could have the cupboard. And she did a deal with them. And uh, she paid for it in fish. Fantastic. So the only cost that this piece of furniture owes you? No, it's not the only cost. It has cost me £1,000 twice in ex-marriages. Um, so I've had to um, pay out a little bit. Um, you obviously like this piece of furniture, I do, yes. if you've held on to it through two, it for, two divorces. I've had it for 38 years now, and um, my aunt, when she died, wanted me to have it, and I've had it ever since. It's a great provenance, isn't it? I mean, it's always nice to know that something yeah. comes from a good house, and yeah. um, you don't get many as good as Hampton no. Court. No. Um, and one of the pieces of it that I like the most are these panels. Yeah. The carving is really crisp and deep, but it's also very, very refined, isn't it? Yeah. And these panels date it to about the, the late 16th, early 17th century. Uh, that's the good news. Now the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is that these panels have been set into a piece of furniture that's been built around them. Okay. Using pieces of, of um, wood yeah. that have been perhaps old choir stalls, panelling from churches, panelling from houses. And you want to know which country it had come from. Had you spotted the, the one ER, which is, is French, Premier, and it means first. Okay. And then on your side, there's 27th. So yeah. these maybe have been numbers of, of on the ends of pews, um, somewhere on choir stools, somewhere possibly in a church. St. Peter in the middle there. But they are pieces of, of wood that have been taken and put together in this form of furniture. There are a few clues. One is um, the difference in the, the dates of, of that the pieces okay, were carved. Yeah. The difference in this piece of wood here, the cornice, has had to be stained to match it and blend it in to yeah. the other pieces. And it's also quite scaled down size. If this was a 17th century um, cupboard, it would be much bigger than this. And it's been scaled down, I think, in the late 19th uh, or even early 20th century. Okay. So it really is a piece of furniture that's evolved over time. I mean, who knows where all these bits of wood originated from. But uh, as far as value goes, you should have stopped after your first marriage because it's worth around £1,000. I've lost money then. <laughs> well, I'm from W.B. Simpson that made this panel and um, I'm a director of the company. Uh, along with my two partners that have been there all their lives and their father was part of the company all of his life um, and we've collected these panels as part of the heritage of the company. So what we're looking at is a sort of company history? Yes, yes. So let, let's look at W.B. Simpson. William Butler Simpson was one of the great names in uh, Victorian tiling. Yes. But of course he goes back much further. From memory, I think he was born in the 1790s and died in the 1880s, so a very, very long life. Is that a picture of him over there? That's W.B. Simpson, yeah. So, is that, so what, how old is he there? Looking at his appearance, we'd guess that, that was, he was about 30. And of course, that may be when he just started the business, which I think was 1833, wasn't That's it? That's correct, yeah. yeah. We, yes, before that, uh, we think he designed wallpaper uh, and interiors and fabrics. 
Well, you should, which takes me to this pattern book. So this is part of the archive, is it? Yes. We're looking at probably, I guess, the 1840s, 1850s. And it's full of decorations like this, which are not for tiles, they're for painted panels in houses. Yes. Um, you had a grand country house, you were setting up a hotel, you know, any of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of decoration that Simpson could offer. You know, you can have a fairly formal arrangement like that, you can have um, stained glass if you want stained glass, and of course, equally, um, you could have sort of illustrative panels, and you can imagine things like this, these rather exotic sort of classical landscapes um, set into big framed panels in drawing rooms and that sort of thing. That's what they were for. And all this, of course, is long before tiling gets going. Tiling is really something that starts in the 1860s and then moves on. I mean, this one we can see is dated 1905. So this is long after Simpson himself died in the 1880s. Mm. Um, but I think he must have shifted his business to tiling when tiling became fashionable. And again, great competitors. Daltons, later Carters, Craven Dunhill, all the big names did tiling. And the emergence of the tile panel as a decorative element is very much of the 1870s and onwards. Um, and it became the sensation of that period with all those names making wonderful panels. Now, these sort of rural England scenes, to me, are associated more with pubs and hotels, sure. where you could actually glorify that vision of the England that actually, to be fair, that was disappearing. You know, all this was vanishing at that time under railways and factories. Mm -hmm. This is what we were thinking about preserving. I think this is a great thing. You say you acquired it, did you? Did you buy it? Uh, I think it was bought through an auction 30 or so years yeah, ago, yeah. Um, just as a panel, yeah. uh, which we've now mounted and kept, kept as a, in as our a offices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if somebody came to you now and said, can you do this again, could you? Um, well, we'd give it a good try, and yeah. I think we might be able to do that, yeah. yeah well, yeah. why not? One day, maybe, <laughs> come back. There's two things here. One is you've got a great factory archive, Two, the things themselves are individually quite valuable. The book, a pattern book like that, is meaningless unless you've got the Simpson connection. Sure. You have, so you're looking at probably three to 5,000 for wow. that as an insight into decoration. The small panels are going to be 1,000 to 1,500 pounds each because they're such great subjects. Maybe Robin Hood, maybe some medieval fantasy, who cares, really? Yeah. Um, but when we come to the big panel, this is really serious stuff. I mean, we're looking at 10 to 15,000 pounds or something wow. like this. So it's, it not that just, <laughs> it's not just your archive, mm. it's also quite important financial history mm. as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now you've brought along this rather small, narrow box, very, very thin box, um, and it it's, holds a secret, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So we open the box and see what's inside. We open that. Now there's a lever behind. If I pull this out, watch what happens. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Gasps from the crowd. Well, that's what it's for. I mean, and it's uh, quite sharp as well, isn't it? It's incredibly sharp. It's handmade. Yes. Every single part of this is handmade. Yes, and it's, to my mind, a very vicious object. Yes, it is indeed. But what's it for? That's the question. Well, I don't know what it's for. Ah. I've owned it for all my life. Before that, you know, it belonged to an old German gentleman. I guess it's over 150 years old for sure, and I still don't know what it is. OK, well, let's look at it and sort of analyse it. Yeah. From the point of view of date, I think the way it's constructed, it must be late 18th century or early 19th century. Yes. Whether it's English or not, I, I'm not sure. I don't think it is English. I think it's continental. Yeah. However, the question is, what is it for? Now. We've got interesting brackets. You see these little pins? Yes, indeed. There's one on either end. Uh -huh. And this is meant, I think, to mount it on something between yes. two pinions, if you like. Um, there's also this lever. Yeah. So it's meant to be pulled remotely. Yeah. And this is meant for deployment right at the last minute. Now, I have to tell you, I've never seen one of these before, ever. Oh, dear. But I think it's one of two things. Either it's for securing on the outside of a door yeah. of some official office, perhaps police office or something like that. In case it's attacked, you would pull this lever 
and out would come these spikes, and there might be several of them in rows yeah. to stop people approaching the door and beating so, it down. Yes. Or it could be something that's attached to a carriage to stop highwaymen attacking yes. the carriage. I think that's, a, that's, that's my conclusion I eventually came to. But I'm not 100% sure. However, we're going to value it. Now, I think it's worth quite a lot of money, actually. Really? I think it's well, most unusual. My grandchildren will be pleased to hear that. Well, <laughs> I think it's most unusual. I wouldn't mind betting that this would sell at auction today for something in the region of 12 to 1500 pounds. Yeah. Well, it was given to myself and my husband by his mother when we moved into our first um, house as a present. And she had bought it at an auction in Bournemouth, um, but I've no idea what she paid for it. And, and I understand you've done some research on this Yes, on well, we were interested in um, gillows. We knew that they were quite famous. And an article in a magazine told us about a museum in London that had their records. So we, we went there, and on microfiche, we each had a, one of the microfiche machines, and we were racing to see who was the first to find it. I bet that took a long time, didn't it? It wasn't too long, probably about half an hour. But then they printed out um, documents for us with all the details of I the... Look. Yes. Right. And these documents are saying? They tell you exactly what the cabinet is made from. Which is? Um, I think it's baywood. Right. And, um, and it tells you precisely uh, all the, ex the exact prices of each item that went into it. And it was made as a music cabinet and it comes out that it cost 18 pounds, 12 shillings and 10 pence. That's brilliant, isn't Very it? Very precise. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that also came off the microfiche, which showed us, which made it easy for us to identify it. Right. So. There's some telltale signs about this cabinet. Um, as soon as you look at it, you know it's by this renowned maker, Gillows of Lancaster. Indeed. And one yeah. of the telltale signs is this. If I pull this drawer open like so, under the underside, and this is almost like Gillow's signature. Oh, right. See these little screws? Yes. And then they've been chamfered down, and there's a little space. That's there so the drawer can expand and con contract without oh. splitting the actual base of the drawer. Right. So it was one of their little signs. And yeah. um, other cabinet makers didn't do it. It was, it was down, just down to Gillow's. These little pieces here, mm -hmm. this is to stop the um, uh, dust. And so when you're cleaning the drawer out, it's actually easier for maintenance. Right. So they were thinking not only for them, but for the people going to use the piece of furniture. And of course, it's stamped here, Gillows, Lancaster. Yes. They were leading cabinet makers in Lancaster, but also they were like interior decorators. And when this was put into the music room, the whole room would have been in this fashion, in what we call um, aesthetic period. This is around 1880, 1900s. Mm. Later into the 1900s, Gillows merged with another company and they were called then Waring and Gillow. But this is just before they merged and so they were just had the brand name Gillows of Lancaster. Right. Because this is aesthetically beautiful, I would put a value on this between three and five thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> But three very pretty Dresden Cupids. Are they your collection? Have they always been together? Um, I'm not sure if they've always been together. They belong to my mum now, but she got them from her mother-in-law, who died about ten years ago. So I'm not sure where they've come from. I mean, are they your taste? Do you, do, do you like them? No, I think they're horrible. <laughs> I'd give them to a charity shop. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it's a very popular style that's been around for a long time. In, in Dresden, these have been made since the 1750s, and they've carried on being made really for an awful long time. And many homes have liked them, but perhaps the traditions for Cupid's Around has waned a little bit. But uh, actually, these are... I, I like some of these, but they're rather different. Which do you think is the best of them? Do you have a, a um, preferences? No, I think they're all horrible, but probably <laughs> yeah. that one I would prefer. Right. I mean, what we need to look at these is who made them and when, and really how well they're made. Yeah. And looking at that one, it's Cupid in disguise. Oh. Cupid there is dressed up as a little girl with a fan. Yeah. And we look at the amount of detail in the way the faces are painted. It's actually not terribly well done on this one. 
Um, this one isn't a good one. <laughs> so, 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 so having put that one out of the way, yeah. there's the mark on the bottom is two lines and a cross. Yeah. It looks like the Dresden sign, yeah. but it's a copy. Ah. This was made in probably about 1900 in Sitzendorf, yeah. a town near Dresden, but isn't the real thing. Ah. But it's copying this one. Yeah. This is Meissen. Meissen's the great factory in Dresden. Yeah. And when you look at the way it's painted, there's a lot more detail there. And the scroll work on the base is so much more precise. Oh, it's yes. just that much better. Yeah. And the mark, very proudly, the cross swords of the Meissen factory. And that's the, that's the mark we always like to see. Yeah. But of course, everyone copies that. It's the easy thing to pretend. Uh, what you can't do is imitate the quality of Meissen. And when Meissen made that in 1870, they were making wonderful quality figurines. Yeah. And then we've got a group here, which actually goes back rather earlier. Oh. Um, this one, again, nice and heavy, and it's a nice and one. I think it's the seasons. This one is, is summer, holding the corn. We've got spring with flowers. Um, that's, well, there was autumn with a goblet, and there's winter warming his hand on a burner. And we look for the telltale mark, and there it is tucked at the back. The early ones are marked round the back. Oh. And if you find one with a cross swords there and it's real and good quality, yeah. we're looking one made in 1745. Wow. So middle of the 18th, 18th century. <laughs> so that's that much older. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's had a bit of mending. It's been a bit yeah. damaged at the base. The tree has been broken off. It's had a bit of a hard life. Yeah. But, but the quality still shines through. So, three different figures yeah. and, and appropriately different values. Because um, she, there is um, a copy, yeah. that one's going to be probably around about £40. It's pretty, but yeah. nothing special. Yeah. The Meissen one, and that one is, is real Meissen, but Victorian Meissen. So, that we're looking at about £600. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and here we've got... Um, just that much older, yeah. mid 18th century, Meissen at its best. Yeah. So, in spite of the damage, we're looking at £1,500 for that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe I like that one best. That's not bad. So, over £2,000 wow. worth of figures. Yeah. But this is the one to treasure. Yeah, and to be careful with on the way home. <laughs> Thank you. Take a look at this toothsome trio here. They may not be the most attractive objects I've ever seen on the Antiques Roadshow, I have to be honest, but they're certainly among the most popular, Toby jugs. And this week's basic Better Best Challenge is set by our ceramic specialist, Henry Sandon, who is a great devotee of Toby jugs, and he's brought three along today. One is worth 50 pounds, one is worth 700, and the best one is worth 1,400 pounds. Can you tell which is which? Let's see what our visitors think. basic for the guy with the brown coat because he seems a little bit more dull and not as like nice looking <laughs> and then better for the guy in the blue and then best for the guy with the green coat with the attractive spots on his face that's right would you fancy owning something like that in your home no <laughs> it's not trendy enough <laughs> <laughs> the handle on that one is better finished than the other two so I'll put that as best. Basic, better, best. And he's best because? He just looks older. His teeth looks a bit sort of shabby and just looks like a good dentist. No, I'll go with him. I like his nose as well. So you like his bad teeth and his sort of beak-like nose. nose? Yes. Is that what you like in a man? Well, like in, a, in a Toby Jack, not so much in a man, but in a Toby Jack. <laughs> that is the best. And that's better. Okay, and why do you think this is the best one? Uh, blue is my favourite colour. Is that really the only <laughs> reason? I'm afraid so, yeah. <laughs> it's just so arbitrary, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God for Henry Sandon. At least he knows what he's talking about. Now, I detected an Australian accent when I first met you. Yes. What's the connection between an Australian and the famous English sea captain? 
Well, I'm the great, great nephew of Captain John Vine Hall, and Captain John Vine Hall was the captain on the maiden voyage of the Great Eastern Steamship. Fantastic. Perhaps one of the most iconic of all English ships of that period. And indeed, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's third shipbuilding masterpiece. Yes. And I mean, just look at this period print. And it's not called Leviathan for nothing. Correct. 692 feet long. Yeah. It weighed three times more than the biggest ship of the period. Nearly 19,000 tons. So your ancestor was commander of this extraordinary ship. And this was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic. And uh, that was in 1860. Right. And uh, I think Brunel, after that voyage, uh, tried to induct uh, Captain John Vinehall into the Royal Institute of Engineers, and for some reason he refused. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ship was driven by these two large paddle wheels, yes. as well as obviously propeller power by a different engine from yes. the back, and designed to carry 4,000 passengers, yes. maybe 10,000 yes. troops in yes. the event of war. But designed for a run to Australia as well as to India, but it, it, it ended up doing the transatlantic route. Yes, just from uh, yeah. England to New York. Yeah, and that's yeah. where your great-great-uncle sailed, Southampton to New York. Correct, yes. What a responsibility. Yes. I mean, a man of great experience, yes. and presumably he had to qualify to command such a new fangled modern ship. He was the first uh, captain to uh, receive qualifications to right. captain a steamship. Yeah, but this thing was built to last because I understand it did actually, on some voyage, hit a rock. But because it had this sort of cellular bottom, it survived hitting oh, a rock. And like the Titanic, who obviously <laughs> worse things happen. So, so an incredible thing. And you've brought along today the most fascinating family archive, and. I had a peep at this small log, mm. which I understand was his personal log book covering the first voyage on the Great Eastern. And we think, we understand from all the research that we've, we've done, that it is the only log book. The, the official ship's log is uh, Lasso. Uh, it's, it's the only record left of that, of that journey. Gosh. And I've had chance to go through these three numbered albums of watercolors yes. in which really he's recording his life at sea's experiences yes. and, and yes. the places he went, the natural history wonders that he saw. Yes. And not only was he commanding a ship of this size, but he was a very talented amateur artist. Yes. I mean, look at the perspective. He's using watercolors. There's gouache to heighten some of the detail. That is a, a fabulous little work of art in its own right. And you've got nearly 150 in the three yes. albums. And I think there were 10 originally. Gosh. So there, there are 10 somewhere in the world. Somewhere <laughs> knocking about. <laughs> How incredible. <laughs> but you've got something, I think, of national importance. These are really an astonishing discovery mm. today. Um, and I've got to put a value on them. So, cumulatively, I would say that this collection is worth somewhere around £40,000. Wow. <laughs> Maybe more. Really? It's unique. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Generally speaking, I like to hold the glass that I'm appraising on the show, but this is a rather rare occasion that, frankly, the less I handle it, the better I feel. So tell me, why on earth have you brought this disaster area into the roadshow today? I think my wife will answer that. Well, I, I bought it for him as a present, and then after a period of time, it started to go crumbly. Yeah. And then you noticed it started to smell. And of sulphur. Sulphur? Yes. Oh, yes. Mm. yes. It was smelly glass that's falling to pieces. This is really not what everybody wants. No. Now, the reason that it is disintegrating is that it's crizzled. It is a lack of alkali in the ingredients. It's like the cake that doesn't rise. The ingredients are rubbish. They were not perfectly balanced. And crizzling is evidenced by a mass of tiny cracks. It's all opalescent rather than see-through, which it would have been. So what did you think you bought? What is this? Right, um, we took it uh, to the museum, um, P&A. Yes. And uh, they 
looked at it and then immediately said that um, it wasn't Venetian glass. Okay, it which certainly looks like it. It, pre it pleased us because by that time we, we were very curious about the whole thing. It was very strange hmm. and we'd come across Sir Robert Mansell. Okay. What you're saying by Sir Robert Mansell is that uh, he was the uh, Admiral, Admiral Sir Robert Mansell mm -hmm. MP, had held the glass monopoly, the monopoly for making right. glass in England under Charles I. So we're talking about before restoration and all that, we are around 1640. A very interesting guy, but boy, that's, that's a big leap. What you're doing is you're linking this to Sir Robert Mansell, which is a pretty hairy occupation to do. I, for a start, one of the problems about glass of that age is, frankly, we don't know what it looked like. We don't. Now, what we do know is that Venetian style, Venice glass, was the dominant glassmaking style over mm. Europe at this yeah. date. But to link this with Mansell is pushing it because, frankly, there are problems about placing it that early. It certainly looks it. Yes. But the linkage between ceramics and glass has always been quite strong. Mm -hmm. So when you see a cup in ceramics like that, you think, this isn't 1640. This yeah. is never, or silver. It could also be in silver, similar forms in silver. This is later. Because for a start, it's too big. Cups and saucers at this date were much smaller, with no t a third smaller. Mm. Further, the handle, it wouldn't have had a handle at that date. Mm. Handles of this type are more neoclassical. This is going back to the Greek, yes. um, and this is later, shall we see. Yep. So whilst it is christened, it looks a million years old, mm -hmm. the chances are it's more like 150 years, probably, than 350. Mm -hmm. no. And okay. that uh -huh. is a fact. Yeah. That is the probability. The value, of course, because we've got a value stuff, is if it was 1640 by... Nobody knows no. what Mansell made anyway, so to say this is what he made is no. you can't go there. It would mean maybe 200 pounds mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an academic curiosity mm -hmm. that you could be brought out at lectures mm -hmm. or put in a museum mm -hmm. cabinet, basement, mm -hmm. Or you accept it as a 150-year-old one and actually worth a tenner. Yes! <laughs> right. <laughs> what does one say to that? The missus has said it all, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, that's the best. Only, I think you best have a fiver for that. That's yeah, fantastic. I don't think I've owned had an owner do a better ending than that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, a beautifully made wooden presentation box, probably of Hollywood, and for me there's no prizes for guessing what is within. There are three pretty little enamel blue eggs. Tell me about them with you. Well, they are my friends whose aunt gave them to her. <laughs> um, she believes they're Russian, um, but that's all she knows about them. Well, I think she probably guess that they were Russian yeah. from the lid satin mm. and it is written in Cyrillic um, but it's clearly legible to enthusiasts of this subject that it actually says the name of uh, an important Russian jeweler but I'd just like to discuss um, at this in, in a back to front way and tell you about the eggs which are sky blue enameled Easter yes. eggs on a necklace and they're surmounted by tiny tiny diamond laurels and that's quite important in a way because in the tradition of uh, jewellery the colour blue is for love and it's something borrowed something blue, blue and yeah. here we have it conspicuously written but above it we also see tiny laurels set with diamonds and this is a visual rebus for um, a Latin phrase which is omnia vincit amor, the triumph of love overall. So here is the, the triumphal laurels um, surmounting the colour blue. But there's also another message coming across here because they are Easter eggs. This is a gift from somebody at Easter in Holy Russia to present to somebody that they love and, and it's the triumph of love over everything. Um, I think it is a triumph because it's survived. It's in absolutely pristine condition which is wonderful for all kinds of good reasons. But let's return to the lid satin once again and it says quite plainly K Fabergé mm -hmm. Moscow. Oh gracious. <laughs> oh wonderful. And we don't need any explanation beyond that to know no. that this is by far the most um, famous goldsmith's workshop that's ever existed. So it's very very exciting it's, stuff. Oh,
right. What are the uh, blue bubbles? What are they? They are made of? of a silver core which has been engraved and then flooded with blue enamel and you're seeing through the um, enamel onto the engraved ground. Oh, I see. And there's a great tradition in Russia to give Easter eggs. In the country you'd have painted white chicken's eggs yeah. to give and in the towns there would be wooden eggs, perhaps ceramic eggs, but in this curious claustrophobic world of the Romanov court and its orbit, um, only Fabergé would do. Mm. This is a whiff of pre-revolutionary oh, Russia wonderful. and in 1917 catastrophe happened because mm -hmm. the Russian Revolution came about yeah. and Fabergé's empire was destroyed utterly and completely and forever and so when we see these things coming through the excitement mounts enormously and mercifully your friend has taken enormous care with it because it's almost perfect condition and it's kept within this box which signs it it's like a picture frame and your friend has an object which is undoubtedly worth 12,000 pounds oh my goodness oh she'd be thrilled to peace oh because quite recently she had a big fire her, her house and uh, quite a lot of things lost and this was one thing that survived well that's wonderful and it may yeah. be some small compensation yeah. but how exciting to see it here today oh, that is absolutely wonderful she'd be thrilled to pieces i'm thrilled to pieces <laughs> <laughs> wonderful i'm exhausted now i don't know about you wonderful wonderful okay. If you remember, I was telling you earlier in the programme about our basic Better Best challenge set by Henry Sandon this week, our ceramic specialist. Three Toby jugs, one worth £50, that's the basic, the better one worth £700, and the best one worth £1,400. Now, Henry, I have to say, among our visitors, we were all a bit nonplussed by them, particularly because, in the nicest possible way, they are just so darn ugly. Oh, no, they're not. They're beautiful. So they? well, what is so lovely about them? They're real jokes. people out there. They have noses and fine noses and pustules on their face and they're, they're drinking beer. But what could be better than that? Yes, look at this one in particular. He's covered in, his, in spots covered in and his warts. teeth are yes, terrible. They're and... a shame, isn't it? Well, they were, of course, the people in those days. And, uh, and I suppose uh, they're named Toby Jugs after Toby Philpot, who was a great drinker in the 18th century, and he was supposed to drink gallons of beer at a time. And, uh, and they're named Toby Jugs, it said, after him. And I think they're great. They derive, of course, from the 18th century, from the 1780s. Uh, when they were invented by Ralph Wood. And uh, the three models here are of the Ralph Wood type, the ordinary jug. Now, very, very much rarer ones come in strange shapes. A fiddler, a chap playing the fiddle, and a chap who, who is ironing clothes and things like that. They're very, very rare. One of the chaps ironing clothes, the tailor, uh, fetched £30,000 really? a few years ago, so they're, they're, they're expensive. Now, these ones aren't in that market. They're the ordinary, the usual Toby Jugs. Well, I had a bit of a go at thinking which I thought was which. <laughs> I mean, this one has its lid. It's got his hat, yes. Which I do very carefully yes. there. So I thought, I presume that must affect the value because the other two do not. <laughs> so... Basic, because I thought he was painted the most basic way. Better, because he has his hat. And then best, well, he's the most ugly. <laughs> and he's got the most detail. <laughs> so, uh, go on, put well, us out of our misery, bad, then. That's not a bad shot, I suppose. Well, the basic one uh, is the latest one in date. He's going to be Victorian one, 1860, 70 in date. And that is this chap. He's a Victorian art. The quality of the making is poorer, no decoration worthy, and, and the he is the basic one. Perhaps 50 quid or something like that. Right. Got that wrong. Okay. So now better? The, the better one? The better one is our friend down here. Um, he, he is a, a Ralph Wood type of about 1790 in date, uh, and um, uh, he is very nicely decorated, but the glaze doesn't work sometimes. The face is poorly decorated. The glaze runs and dribbles down his coat. It's not terribly well controlled. Uh, and um, he, he basically would go for something like about um, 
700 pounds and was auctioned that one. I mean, one of our visitors chose him as the best one because she thought his teeth were so terrible. He deserved <laughs> a recognition all of his own. Well, people in the 18th century all had bad teeth. No, quite. <laughs> so this is the best one, which I, I happened on by chance, really. Yeah, yeah. But certainly the modelling is, is the finest of the three, isn't the it? The modelling is fine. And also the painting. I mean, the face is absolutely fantastically well painted. And the base, this wonderful marbling around the base is exceptional. You very seldom get that. And he's by Neil. Uh, a, a noted maker of Toby Jugs in about the 1790 period, uh, and he is the best of the three of them. And be valued at auction somewhere around about the 1500 or so bracket. Goodness me. And you've got some in your home, Henry? I've got lots in my home, yes. <laughs> Including some of me. <laughs> Very embarrassing, but I, I find them great fun. Well, they're great uh, characters, yes. pustules and all. <laughs> and if you've got any Toby jugs at home, hopefully this has given you some idea what to look for. And actually, there are some tips on our website as well, so have a look. It's bbc.co.uk slash Antiques Roadshow. It's a really lovely Chinese painting. It's so obviously Chinese. And we've got two of the eight immortals here. We've got a man called Li Jie Guai. And, um, you know, for all the world, it is a Chinese painting. Yes. Uh, but there's a rather strange clue on here as to where it might have come from. And it says Montgolfier in the watermark. How did you come by that? My husband's grandfather, George Mottershed, was a road surveyor in Hampshire before the First World War. And he joined up. He went into building roads for the troops at the front. Oh, right. And, and, and this is then this is him. That's him there, yes. Uh -huh. And he had working under him a troop of Chinese coolies. He called them coolies, um, with no disrespect. And they were building roads for the troops uh, right from 1916 to 1919, I think. And he had a lot of respect for his team. He, he liked working with them. When they disbanded at the end of the war. The gangmaster presented him with two painted scrolls, and he was very, very touched by this gesture. And he had them framed and took them home, and they were his treasured possessions. And we inherited them about five years ago. Well, I, I must say, I don't think I've ever seen Chinese paintings on French paper. So Probably it not. is so interesting with the, you know, the connection that we know that they were painted in France. Yes. Now, the Chinese Labour Corps was largely shipped out of Shantung province. It became clear that uh, by 1916 we needed labour to work with mm. your grandfather-in-law as engineers. They did all the sort of basic work. They laid roads, uh, as they did with him, they dug trenches, and eventually, after the war, they cleared up all the barbed wire. And there are various debates about how many there were, mm. uh, but there were about 150,000, maybe as many as 200,000 really? Chinese labourers who worked with the Allies uh, through that second half of the war. And did he ever write about any particular incidents with them or anything like that? Did he? No, but he told his daughters a few, a few tales. Um, one was that they were so short of road materials that when the theatre of war shifted from one place to another, they took up the road they'd made and moved it to the new place. And when they came to a hole they couldn't cross, he commandeered a wagon load of tins of bully beef and tipped them in because they had more bully beef than they had road material, so they crossed the gap on bully poly beef. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and he clearly had a very close relationship with them. And interestingly, yes. um, they uh, stayed on after the war, lots and lots of them. And I suspect that some of the diaspora of Chinese yes. in France and in England that came from this group of labor that was sent over. And in fact, in, uh, in France, about 2,000 died during the war. Uh, and there are, there's one wonderful graveyard uh, by Lutchens mm -hmm. with a Chinese gate over the entrance uh, where there are 2,000 of them uh, buried and it's in a place called Noyelle sur mer um, and most unusual because all the others are standard uh, war graves but this is a, an unusual Chinese How one. Amazing, yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, I have a connection with this, strangely, mm -hmm. because my great-grandfather, same generation, Yes was in Shantung province oh. and was responsible for recruiting them well, to know. send to the front. In modern terms, of course, one would think that was a shameful thing to, uh, to do and I think they were paid very little uh, and it uh, was three months journey and some were sunk on the way and so on. So, I mean, it's not something one should feel entirely proud of. But the fact is the Chinese today are very keen to 
rehabilitate the value of the Chinese labor court. Not surprised. Um, no. and, and this is such an interesting uh, thing. And the sad thing is that apart from to you and I who have a particular interest in, they're not worth a huge amount no, of money. No, no, um, you realize they wouldn't be. And so whilst you, know, you and I think they're fabulous, uh, I think commercially they're worth probably no more than you've got two of them, I suppose, four or five hundred pounds for the pair. Mm. Which is not a huge no, amount of money. It doesn't matter, no. Um, do you know anything about the inscription? How, why? People well, regrettably, I can't read it either. No. Um, and maybe somebody who sees this will be able to translate it and tell us what it says. That would be lovely. I would it? love to know. Yes. Right. Thank you very thank much. You. She's got this wonderful, serene look about her, hasn't she? She obviously hasn't been in the sun. Has no. she been out much at all? No. Um, I've had her for five years and just had her in a bag in a box under the bed um, and when my sister had her she had her in a bag in a box under the bed so she hasn't seen the daylight no poor little mite yeah um, now you said your sister had her but obviously yeah. she's a good deal older than your yes. uh, generation so whose was she before that um, my sister was a carer um, and she belonged to an old lady that she looked after and she gave her to my sister so that's yeah. that's the link yes well she's she's lovely she's what's known as a china uh, shoulder china doll because her head and her shoulders are all made in, in one piece, as you can okay. see. And in fact, I'm rather pleased that she's undressed because it, you can totally see the construction yeah. here. So she's been stitched on to this uh, calico body. You can see the wide hips here, not because women had huge hips, mm. but it was the fashion of the time to have okay. wider skirts yeah. and that would have given the width to the skirt yeah. uh, when she was fully dressed. Uh, have you done any research on her? Um, no, not really. I did have a quick look on the internet oh. last night, um, but drew a blank, really. I just thought she may be German. Well, she's got a good chance. I mean, these uh, China-headed dolls were made, the majority came from Germany, okay. there's no question. They were made elsewhere too, but the majority were German. I, I've got no reason to think that she won't be. Um, what about date? I know some of them are like 1800s, but then they went into the 1900s, so no, I really haven't got a clue. Okay, well, it's somewhere in the middle there. Should, okay, I, should we try okay. and pin it down yeah. a bit? Okay. <laughs> um, well, one good way of looking uh, and being able to date a doll, particularly one which has got an elaborate hair do, okay. is to look at that hairstyle. And there we can see it's, it's plaited at the sides and then yeah. tied back into this sort of loose, uh, low chignon. Uh, so that's, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pinpoint it to a precise year but I would say between 1855 and 1860 so okay. you know you can you can you can get a good guide yeah. from that yeah. um, she's not a hugely valuable doll but she's still collectible and I would put her at around 300 really? to perhaps 350 oh, okay. pounds yeah that's very good yeah I'm quite pleased with that lovely thank you as we approach the centenary of the First World War, which will obviously be in 2014, I think we're going to be interested more and more and more in not so much the grand battles. We know about all those. We know less and less about people's practical experiences. What was it like on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, who are we looking at here? This is my uncle, Fred Noakes, Draper from Tunbridge Wells. Yep. Um, tried and tried to enlist, kept failing the medical finally got in as a conscript in 1917 and proceeded to write lots and lots of letters home. Which survive? Yeah. Some of them? Yes. And these were what, to his mother? To his mother, to his father, to his sister mostly, right. sometimes to his brothers who weren't very old at the time. And now I've seen in my life hundreds, thousands of First World War postcards letters and they're normally pretty brief. I mean, the most basic is a postcard where you tick the box. Yeah. I am alive, I am dead, you know, that sort yeah. of stuff. Um, and so to write long letters is in itself quite unusual because, of course, everything had to be censored. Yeah. Um, and it also reveals what you've said about this thing about he was desperate to get in the army. Yes. Uh, we forget that until 1916, it was a, a war, from the British point of view, fought by volunteers. Yes. And it was people like him who kept trying and kept yeah. trying and kept trying yes. um, that kept the whole thing going. Yeah. So he wrote these letters home, and I mean, randomly, I picked one out, which I think is really very entertaining. This afternoon, I and my sparring partner, somehow or other, purposefully, forgot to go on parade. And falling in with a sergeant and a quartermaster sergeant, who were also dodging work, we spent the afternoon playing football and nearly expired with the heat. 
Well, that doesn't really sound quite like frontline life, does it? No, no, that's typical of the sort of things that he liked to pick up on, though, to tell people at home. Yeah. Because he didn't want to mention the horrors. Yeah. Now, I think it's fair to say that at that point, I think that's post-war. How long did he serve? Well, from 1917, when he finally managed to get in, he was finally demobbed. And he hadn't had any leave up to this point. Mm. Uh, Christmas 1919. Yeah, which this is another thing we forget about. We think the war ended on the 11th of November 1918. In fact, it didn't. No. For people like him, duties continued. OK, they weren't at risk of being shot, but army life was maintained. Yeah. Army discipline was maintained. And he didn't go home for a long time. No. Now, he's gone. Um, anything physical surviving from him? Oh, yes. Oh, yes? Yep. I've got his watch that he was wearing when he was waiting to go over the top at the Canal du Nord ah, 1918. this is actually it? Yep, that's it. So there it is, and inscribed on the back, yep. Private F. Noakes, 3rd Coldstream Guards, and the address in Tunbridge Wells. Yeah. So he was wearing that? He was wearing that, looking at the luminous dial to see what the time was, because they knew exactly what time they were going. They were going over going. very early. Yeah. That's remarkable. And you just wear it? Yes. And, and anything that's horrible, I know that watch has been through worse. It's and su and survived. Yes. So, so it's like a talisman. Yes. It keeps you going. Absolutely. I think that's lovely. Now, what's it all worth? Well, there is value in the documents simply because they're rare survivals. Not so many letters in piles survive like that. The real thing is the watch. Um, if that watch was put up for sale, it would fetch two, three hundred pounds, four hundred pounds possibly, as a First World War watch. Yeah. But the story you add greatly increases that price yeah. in my mind, if not in financial terms. Yeah. I'd love to be wearing my, you know, a relative's watch from the First yeah. World War. Well done. So keep him going. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Small objects like that First World War watch can tell us so much about an important time in our history. And we're planning an antiques roadshow to commemorate the centenary of the First World War. And we're looking for stories of, of heroism, of, of loss, of the human impact of the Great War. So if you've any objects associated with that time, through your family perhaps, we'd love to hear from you. So contact us either by email to antiques.roadshow at bbc.co.uk or in writing to the address on your screen. A few years ago, I, I had a call from um, BBC Look North. It, in the light of the Chilean mining disaster, their attention had been drawn to the fact that local re residents had found an old Victorian rubbish tip and had sending down shafts, like mine shafts, into the tip. And clearly the council had issued an order banning this because of the safety, of the, the fear of collapse. And you know jolly well what they were looking for, don't you? Yes, old bottles. <laughs> and that's how I got into it. It really back in the 1980s I was doing some research on my great-grandfather's company he was a mineral water manufacturer in Gravesend and um, one night we uh, went to the local pub myself and my brother and he just happened to say that round the back of the pub they were uh, building houses on an old Victorian rubbish tip so he said you fancy having a look so we went round the back and there were just bottles everywhere laying everywhere we were hoping to find one from my great grandfather's company but we never did what's that the name of that company ch perry okay and what did Manor they make um, lemon fizzy lemonade really. okay yeah but people um, will take a, a, a glancing view at these and think oh well, we've dug up things like that in the garden yeah but i suspect that we're in the presence of uh, a rather elevated collection here well yeah because when i first started the one of the first bottles i found up there was quite a rare star-shaped poison and via that I met other collectors and um, I oh, found you out caught, about... you caught notoriety. Yes, yeah, I found yeah. out in a network of clubs and there's also magazines and shows. But with the poisons it just got to be too much, there are so many. So what I did, I whittled it down just to the patented shapes that were developed. Go on then, show us what you're talking about. Well, um, back in the Victorian times of course there was no electric or anything like that. There was gas if you were lucky or candle power. And so what was happening is that people were getting up in the night or whatever, reaching for their medicine, for their cough, 
but of course reached for the wrong bottle and picked up the bottle of carbolic acid, drink that, and there was a lot of deaths yeah. uh, via it. So what happened is that chemists, doctors and glass companies um, all started to patent different shapes so that they felt odd to the touch. So you'd get up in the night, it would feel strange, it would have grooves or bobbles or whatever on it, so you knew that it was odd and so you'd be wary of drinking it. So they presumably all date, what, 1860s onwards? That's right, that's when the first uh, true poison bottle was patented, and right up to the 1920s until electric light was prevalent. So you're predominantly blue, obviously, here, yeah. which delineated poison? Yes. That, so blue was Originally, poison? Originally, yes. OK, and, and what about that green and amber, on. then? Um, they just came along later. Um, a lot of the glass companies just diverted into what, what they probably thought, well, the main thing is the shape, okay. so colour. Well, what do you, you know, show us, show us something stonking. Well, probably the classic uh, English poison bottle is the uh, coffin. The shape of a coffin? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. shape of a coffin. <laughs> Can't get much more macabre than that. That was patented by Langford in 1871. Okay. Very rare. There's only about six known worldwide, and half of those are damaged. Yeah, there's the nutter in you coming in. Yeah. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Um, um, oh, I'll lay that down. And what about bit... the skull? Now, the skull, that was, that's an American. That's the only American bottle I've got in the collection. The rest but of these are English? The rest are English, yeah. Well, generally speaking, I mean, blue sell in shops for about a tenner. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's a good thing to collect. If you're a youngster coming into the hobby, you can pick them up as little. Was 50p. But when you and start what are the restrictions about going into tips these days? Um, oh, it's almost impossible. Oh, is because that right? Because of health and safety, just you right. just cannot do it. So you'd anymore. have to check a club to yeah. find out what you can do and. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm thinking that blue ones go for a bit more than green ones. No, which go no, not necessarily. No, no. I'm just thinking of my level, which is oh, the right. tenors. <laughs> so, how much are you paying for these things? Well, I've been very lucky, actually, because a lot of these I've got in the early days of the hobby. So, oh, you mean um, the whole thing is picking up? It's it, a hot collected It's field. really, it's collected worldwide it's, now, all these items, okay. and so it is very difficult. So how, how well, much are you...? For, well, the coffin... Um, There'd be a, quite a few people that would be willing to pay twelve thousand for that. Um, what? Twelve thousand. <laughs> twelve thousand pounds? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Twelve thousand yeah. pounds. Let me see it. Yeah. I there need it. Don't drop it. Look at that. <laughs> That's twelve grand. Yeah. Go on, hit me again. Well, there's only hit about me harder. Six, well, that one. Well, no, that one's about two thousand. Is it's that 12. right? Yeah. So how much you got on the table here? I bet you selling at auction. Around about fifty k. Fifty thousand pounds here. There's only one thing for it. <laughs> and if you drop that, you will be dead. <laughs> Do you remember how I started the programme? All the way up there, terrifyingly, on the fighting platform of HMS Gannett. Well, fortunately, the producers have allowed me down here to the safety of the forward deck. And all the rigging you can see around me, miles and miles of rope, were made here at the ropery. So from HMS Gannett and historic dockyard Chatham, from all the Roadshow team, bye-bye. The Roadshow returns to Chatham next week at the later time of 8 o'clock. Next tonight, original British drama with an all-star cast. It's a timeless mystery. The Lady Vanishes. Um, documents for us with all the details of I the have a look? yes right and these documents are saying they tell you exactly what the cabinet is made from which is um, I think it's baywood right and um, and it tells you precisely uh, all the, ex the exact prices of each item that went into it and it was made as a music cabinet and it comes out that it cost 18 pounds 12 shillings and 10 pence that's brilliant, isn't Very it? Very precise. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that also came off the microfiche, which showed us, which made it easy for us to identify it. Right. So. There's some telltale signs about this cabinet. Um, as soon as you look at it, you know it's by this renowned maker, Gillows of Lancaster. Indeed. One yeah. of the telltale signs is this. If I pull this drawer open like so, under the underside, and this is almost like Gillows signature. Oh, right. See these little screws? Yes. And then they've been chamfered down and there's a little space. That's there so the drawer can expand and con contract. 
without oh. splitting the actual base of the drawer. Right. It was one of their little signs. And um, other cabinet makers didn't do it. It was, it was down, just down to Gillows. These little pieces here, mm -hmm. this is to stop the um, uh, dust. And so when you're cleaning the drawer out, it's actually easier for maintenance. Right. So they were thinking not only for them, but for the people who are going to use the piece of furniture. And of course, it's stamped here, Gillows, Lancaster. Yes. They were leading cabinet makers in Lancaster, but also they were like interior decorators. And when this was put into the music room, the whole room would have been in this fashion, in what we call um, aesthetic period. This is around 1880, 1900s. Mm. Later into the 1900s, Gillows merged with another company and they were called then Waring and Gillow. But this is just before they merged and so they were just had the brand name Gillows of Lancaster. Right. Because this is aesthetically beautiful, I would put a value on this between three and five thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> And three very pretty Dresden Cupids. Are they your collection? Have they always been together? Um, I'm not sure if they've always been together. They belong to my mum now, but she got them from her mother-in-law, who died about ten years ago. So I'm not sure where they've come from. Right. Are they your taste? Do you, do, do you like them? No, I think they're horrible. <laughs> I'd give them to a charity shop. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, I mean, it's a very popular style that's, that's been around for a long time. I mean, in Dresden, these have been made since the 1750s, and they've carried on being made really for an awful long time. And many homes have liked them. Perhaps... Bet you. Yes. What's the connection between an Australian and the famous English sea captain? Well, I'm the great-great-nephew of Captain John Vine Hall, and Captain John Vine Hall was the captain on the maiden voyage of the Great Eastern Steamship. Fantastic. Perhaps one of the most iconic of all English ships of that period. And indeed, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's third shipbuilding masterpiece. Yes. And I mean, just look at this period print. And it's not called Leviathan for nothing. Correct. 692 feet long. Yeah. It weighed three times more than the biggest ship of the period. Nearly 19,000 tons. So your ancestor was commander of this extraordinary ship. And this was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic. And uh, that was in 1860. Right. And uh, I think Brunel, after that voyage, uh, tried to induct uh, Captain John Vinehall into the Royal Institute of Engineers, and for some reason he refused. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ship was driven by these two large paddle wheels, yes. as well as, obviously, propeller power by a different engine from yes. the back. And designed to carry 4,000 passengers, yes. maybe 10,000 yes. troops in yes. the event of war, but designed for a run to Australia as well as to India. But it, it ended up doing the transatlantic route. Yes, just from uh, yeah. England to New York. Yeah, and that's yeah. where your great-great-uncle sailed, Southampton to New York. Correct, yes. What a responsibility. Yes. I mean, a man of great experience. Yes. And presumably he had to qualify to command such a new, fangled, modern ship. He was the first uh, captain to uh, receive qualifications to right. captain a steamship. Yeah, but this thing was built to last because I understand it did actually, on some voyage, hit a rock. But because it had this sort of cellular bottom, it survived hitting oh, a rock, and like the Titanic, who obviously <laughs> worse things happen. So, so an incredible thing. And you brought along today the most fascinating family archive, and. I had a peep at this small log, mm. which I understand was his personal log book covering the first voyage on the Great Eastern. And we think, we understand from all the research that we've, we've done, that it is the only log book. The, the official ship's log is uh, Lasso. Uh, it's, it's the only record left of that, of that journey. Gosh. And I've had chance to go through these three numbered albums of watercolours yes. in which really he's recording his life at sea's experiences yes. and, and yes. the places he went, the natural history wonders that he saw. Yes. And not only was he commanding a ship of this size, but he was a very talented amateur artist. Yes. I mean, look at the perspective, he's using watercolours, there's gua. The Chinese Labour Corps was largely shipped out of Shantung province. 
it became clear that uh, by 1916 we needed Labour to work with your grandfather-in-law as engineers. They did all the sort of basic work. They laid roads uh, as they did with him, they dug trenches and eventually after the war they cleared up all the barbed wire and there are various debates about how many there were mm. uh, but there were about 150,000 maybe as many as 200,000 really? Chinese laborers who worked with the Allies uh, through that second half of the war and did he ever write about any particular incidents with them or anything like that? Did he? No, but he told his daughters a few, a few tales. Um, one was that they were so short of road materials that when the theatre of war shifted from one place to another, they took up the road they'd made and moved it to the new place. And when they came to a hole they couldn't cross, he commandeered a wagon load of tins of bully beef and tipped them in because they had more bully beef than they had road material. So they crossed the gap on bully poly beef. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and he clearly had a very close relationship with them. And interestingly, yes. um, they uh, stayed on after the war, lots and lots of them. And I suspect that some of the diaspora of Chinese yes. in France and in England that came from this group of labor that was sent over. And in fact, in, uh, in France, about 2,000 died during the war. Uh, and there are, there's one wonderful graveyard uh, by Lutchens mm -hmm. with a Chinese gate over the entrance uh, where there are 2,000 of them uh, buried and it's in a place called Noyelles-sur-Mer. Um, and most unusual because all the others are standard uh, war graves but this is a, an unusual Chinese Amazing, one. Amazing, yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, I have a connection with this, strangely, mm -hmm. because my great-grandfather, same generation, Yes was in Shantung province oh. and was responsible for recruiting them well, to never. send to the front. In modern terms, of course, one would think that was a shameful thing to, uh, to do and I think they were paid very little uh, and it uh, was three months journey and some were sunk on the way and so on. So, I mean, it's not something one should feel entirely proud of but the fact is the Chinese today are very keen to rehabilitate the value of the Chinese labor corps. Not surprised. Um, no. and, and this is such an interesting uh, thing. And the sad thing is that apart from to you and I who have a particular interest in, they're not worth a huge amount no, of money. No, no, they um, realized they wouldn't be. And so whilst you, know, you and I think they're fabulous, uh, I think commercially they're worth probably no more than, you've got two of them, I suppose, four or five hundred pounds for the pair. Mm which is not a huge no, amount of money. No, it doesn't matter, no. Um, do you know anything about the inscription? How, why? And there's Winter warming his hand on a burner. And we look for the telltale mark, and there it is tucked at the back. The early ones are marked round the back. And if you find one with a cross sword there, and it's real and good quality, yeah. we're looking one made in 1745. Wow. So, middle of the 18th, 18th <laughs> century. So, that's that much older. Yeah. Wow. It's had a bit of mending, it's been a bit yeah. damaged at the base, the tree has been broken off, it's had a bit of a hard life, yeah. but, but the quality still shines through. So, three different figures yeah. and, and appropriately different values. Because um, she, there is um, a copy, yeah. that one's going to be probably around about £40. It's pretty, but yeah. nothing special. Yeah. The Meissen one, I mean, that one is, is real Meissen, but Victorian Meissen. So that we're looking at about £600. <laughs> <laughs> and here we've got um, just that much older, yeah. mid 18th century, Meissen at its best. Yeah. So in spite of the damage, we're looking at £1,500 for that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe I like that one best. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> so, so over £2,000 wow. worth of figures. Yeah. But this is the one to treasure. Yeah, to be careful with on the way home. <laughs> Thank you. Take a look at this toothsome trio here. They may not be the most attractive objects I've ever seen on the Antiques Roadshow, I have to be honest, but they're certainly among the most popular. Toby jugs. And this week's basic Better Best Challenge is set by our ceramic specialist, Henry Sandon, who is a great devotee of Toby jugs. And he's brought three along today. One is worth £50, one is worth £700, and the best one is worth £1,400. Can you tell which is which? Let's see what our visitors think. 
basic for the guy with the brown coat because he seems a little bit more dull and not as like nice looking. <laughs> and then better for the guy in the blue and then best for the guy with the green coat. With the attractive spots on his face? That's right. Would you fancy owning something like that in your home? No. <laughs> it's not trendy enough. <laughs> <laughs> the handle on that one is better finished than the other two, so I'll put that as best. Basic, better, best. And he's best because? He just looks older. His teeth looks a bit sort of shabby and just looks like a good dentist. No, I'll go with him. I like his nose as well. So you like his bad teeth and his sort of beak-like nose? nose. Yes. Is that what you like in a man? Well, like in a in a Toby Jack, not so much. Sort of Shantung province. It became clear that uh, by 1916 we needed labour to work with mm. your grandfather-in-law as engineers. They did all the sort of basic work. They laid roads uh, as they did with him. They dug trenches, and eventually, after the war, they cleared up all the barbed wire. And there are various debates about how many there were, mm. uh, but there were about 150,000, maybe as many as 200,000 really? Chinese labourers who worked with the Allies uh, through that second half of the war. And did he ever write about any particular incidents with them or anything like that? Did he? No, but he told his daughters a few, a few tales. Um, one was that they were so short of road materials that when the theatre of war shifted from one place to another, they took up the road they'd made and moved it to the new place. And when they came to a hole they couldn't cross, he commandeered a wagon load of tins of bully beef and tipped them in because they had more bully beef than they had road material. So they crossed the gap on bully bully beef. <laughs> So, yeah. and, and he clearly had a very close relationship with them. And interestingly, yes. um, they uh, stayed on after the war, lots and lots of them. And I suspect that some of the diaspora of Chinese yes. in France and in England came from this group of labor that was sent over. And in fact, in, uh, in France, about 2,000 died during the war. Uh, and there are, there's one wonderful graveyard uh, by Lutchen with a Chinese gate over the entrance uh, where there are 2,000 of them uh, buried and it's in a place called Noyelles-sur-Mer um, and most unusual because all the others are standard uh, war graves but this is a, an unusual Chinese oh, one. Amazing, yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, I have a connection with this, strangely, mm. because my great-grandfather, same generation, yes. was in Shantung province oh. and was responsible for recruiting them well, to never. send to the front. In modern terms, of course, one would think that was a shameful thing to uh, to do, and I think they were paid very little, uh, and it uh, was three months' journey, and some were sunk on the way, and so on. So, I mean, it's not something one should feel entirely proud of, but the fact is the Chinese today are very keen to rehabilitate the value of the Chinese labour corps. Not surprised. Um, no. and, and this is such an interesting uh, thing, and the sad thing is that Apart from to you and I, who have a particular interest in, they're not worth a huge amount no, of money. No, no, um, you realise they wouldn't be. And so, whilst you know, you and I think they're fabulous. Uh, I think commercially, they're worth probably no more than you've got two of them. I suppose four or five hundred pounds for the pair, mm. which is not a huge no, amount of money. No, it doesn't matter. No. Um, do you know anything about the inscription? How, why? People well, regrettably, I can't read it either. No. Um, ...dominated by war with France and Holland, so being close to the Channel and the North Sea meant that Chatham on the River Medway was an ideal place for the Royal Navy to base and build its fleet. Chatham Royal Dockyard was the principal shipbuilding yard for the Royal Navy, and between 1700 and 1815, 125 ships were built and launched here, providing work for nearly 2,000 men from 26 different trades. Many of the Georgian buildings are still here, a reminder that this was once the most important dockyard in Britain. One building that's remained in constant use throughout the dockyard's 400-year history is the ropery. Sail ships like Admiral Nelson's HMS Victory, which was built and launched here, required 20 miles of rope for its rigging alone. The rope walk stretches nearly a quarter of a mile, and with such a distance, using a bike makes life a lot easier. The bikes are a new addition. 
But the Rotary is full of the original Victorian machinery. And back then it was a sweaty, noisy, exhausting business. And these days Chatham rope makers are still making rope commercially and they're the only ones in the world using these traditional techniques. In 1984, the dockyard closed and is now a museum welcoming visitors from all over the country. So, it's time to raise the roadshow anchor and set sail as we join our specialists and residents of the nearby Medway towns. And for you land lovers watching at home, you can play along with our valuation game. Just press red on your remote control or go to bbc.co.uk slash antiques roadshow on your computer or on your smartphone. Now, I always think that the best paintings of sailors and the sea are by sailors first and artists second. Yes. And here is one, William Lionel Whaley. And uh, he was a local man, wasn't he? I believe he was, yes. He did work in the, in the Midway and also the Thames, and then he moved to Portsmouth, I believe. Yes, I think that's right. And uh, is, that, uh, is that not recognisable as Rochester Castle? Rochester Castle. So right over there, yes. I think I'm right in saying. Yes, and that is uh, one of the quarries being unloaded by uh, hand, coal. So, so it's coal being lifted out of the hold yes. by these, uh, these four... Were yes. they Steve doors or...? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hauling it out, and there's a fellow here, I rather like him, he's, he's, he's shouting, isn't he? I yes. don't know what he's doing. Is that a mug of beer? Could that be? Yes. So he's having a jolly good old drink yeah. and a shout. And uh, it's such a bustle, such a lively scene, and you really do get a strong sense of... Uh, and when would it be about, do you think? About um, early 1900s. That's what I think, yes. Or, or perhaps even earlier, yes. actually. And here are the barges, they're loading the coal into Yes. It. Yes, it is, indeed. But what's it for? That's the question. Well, I don't know what it's for. Ah. Well, I've owned it for all my life. Before that, yeah, I belonged to an old German gentleman. I guess it's over 150 years old, for sure. And I still don't know what it is. OK, well, let's look at it and sort of analyse it. Yeah. From the point of view of date, I think the way it's constructed, it must be late 18th century or early 19th century. Yes. Whether it's English or not, I, I'm not sure. I don't think it is English. I think it's continental. Yeah. However, the question is, what is it for? Now, we've got interesting brackets. You see these little pins? Yes, indeed. There's one on either end. Uh -huh. And this is meant, I think, to mount it on something between yes. two pinions, if you like. Um, there's also this lever, yeah. so it's meant to be pulled remotely. Yeah. And this is meant for deployment right at the last minute. Now, I have to tell you, I've never seen one of these before, ever. Oh dear. But I think it's one of two things. Either it's for securing on the outside of a door yeah. of some official office, perhaps police office or something like that, in case it's attacked, you would pull this lever and out would come these spikes, and there might be several of them in rows yeah. to stop people approaching the door and That's beating it down. Yes. Or it could be something that's attached to a carriage to stop highwaymen attacking yeah. the carriage. I think that's, a, that's, that's my conclusion I eventually came to. But I'm not 100% sure. However, we're going to value it. Now, I think it's worth quite a lot of money, actually. Really? I think it's My grandchildren would be pleased to hear that. Well, <laughs> I think it's most unusual. I wouldn't mind betting that this would sell at auction today for something in the region of 12 to 1,500 pounds. Yeah. Well, it was given to myself and my husband by his mother when we moved into our first um, house as a present. And she had bought it at an auction in Bournemouth, um, but I've no idea what she paid for it. And, and I understand you've done some research on Yes, on this well, cabinet. we were interested in um, Gillows. We knew that they were quite famous. And an article in a magazine told us about a museum in London that had their records. So we, we went there, and on microfiche, we each had a, one of the microfiche machines, and we were racing to see who was the first to find it. But and that took a long time, didn't it? It wasn't too long, probably about half an hour. But then they printed out um, documents for us with all the details of I the... Have a look? Yes. Right. And these documents are saying? They tell you exactly what the cabinet is made from. Which is? Um, I think it's Baywood. Right. And, um, and it... Wonderful. <laughs> 
If you remember, I was telling you earlier in the program about our basic better best challenge set by Henry Sandon this week, our ceramic specialist. Three Toby jugs, one worth 50 pounds, that's the basic, the better one worth 700 pounds, and the best one worth 1400 pounds. Now, Henry, I have to say, among our visitors, we were all a bit nonplussed by them, particularly because, in the nicest possible way, they are just so darn ugly. Oh, no, they're not. They're beautiful. So anyway. what, what is so lovely about them? They're real dogs? people out there. They have noses and fine noses and pustules on their face and they're, they're drinking beer. But what could be better than that? Yes, look at this one in particular. He's covered in spots in warts, and his teeth are yes, terrible. Yes, and... shame, is it? Well, they were, of course, the people in those days. And, uh, and I suppose uh, they're named Toby Jugs after Toby Philpot. He was a great drinker in the 18th century, and he was supposed to drink gallons of beer at a time. And, uh, and they're named Toby Jugs, it said, after him. And I think they're great. They derive, of course, from the 18th century, from the 1780s, uh, when they were invented by Ralph Wood. And uh, the three models here, are of the Ralph Wood type, the ordinary jug. Now, very, very much rarer ones come in strange shapes. A fiddler, a chap playing the fiddle, and a chap who, who is ironing clothes and things like that. They're very, very rare. One of the chaps ironing clothes, the tailor, uh, fetched £30,000 really? a few years ago. So they're, they're, they're expensive. Now, these ones aren't in that market. They're the ordinary, the usual Toby Jug shapes. Well, I had a bit of a go at thinking which I thought was which. I mean, this one has its lid. It's got his hat, yes. Which I do very carefully yes. there. So I thought, I presume that must affect the value because the other two do not. So, basic, because I thought he was painted the most basic way. Better because he has his hat. And then best, well, he's the most ugly. <laughs> and he's got the most detail. <laughs> so, uh, Go on, put well, us out of our misery, bad, then. That's not a bad shot, I suppose. Well, the basic one uh, is the latest one in date. He's going to be Victorian one, 1860, 70 in date. And that is this chap. He's a Victorian art. The quality of the making is poorer, no decoration worthy, and, and the he is the basic one. Perhaps 50 quid or something like that. Right. Got that wrong. Okay. So now, better? The, the better one. The better one is our friend down here. Um, he, he is a, a Ralph Wood type of about 1790 in date, uh, and um, uh, he is very nicely decorated. But the glaze doesn't work sometimes. The face is poorly decorated. Oh, don't you? Yes, old bottles. <laughs> and that's how I got into it, really. Back in the 1980s, I was doing some research on my great grandfather's company. He was a mineral water manufacturer in Gravesend, and. Um, one night we uh, went to the local pub, myself and my brother, and he just happened to say that round the back of the pub they were uh, building houses on an old Victorian rubbish tip. So he said, you fancy having a look? So we went round the back and there were just bottles everywhere, laying everywhere. We were hoping to find one from my great-grandfather's company, but we never did. What's that the name of that later. company? C.H. Perry. Okay, and what did Manor they make? Um, lemon, fizzy lemonade, really. Okay. Yeah. But people will take a, a, a glancing view at these and think, oh, we've dug up things like that in the garden. Yeah. But I suspect that we're in the presence of uh, a rather elevated collection here. Well, yeah, because when I first started, the, one of the first bottles I found up there was quite a rare star-shaped poison. And via that, I met other collectors, and um, I oh, found caught, out about... you caught notoriety. Caught, yes, yeah, I found yeah. out in the network of clubs, and there's also magazines and shows. But with the poisons, it just got to be too much. There are so many. So what I did, I whittled it down just to the patented shapes that were developed. Go on, then. Show us what you're talking about. Well, um, back in the Victorian times, of course, there was no electric or anything like that. There was gas, if you were lucky, or candle power. And so what was happening is that people were getting up in the night or whatever, reaching for their medicine, for their cough, but of course reached for the wrong bottle and picked up the bottle of carbolic acid, drink that, and there was a lot of deaths yeah. uh, via it. So what happened is that chemists, doctors and glass companies um, all started to patent different shapes so that they felt odd to the touch. So you'd get up in the night, it would feel strange, it would have grooves or bobbles or whatever on it, so you knew that it was odd and so you'd be wary of drinking it. So 
they presumably all date, what, 1860s onwards? That's right, that's when the first uh, true poison bottle was patented, and right up to the 1920s until electric light was prevalent. So you're predominantly blue, obviously, here, yeah. which delineated poison? Yes. That, so blue was Originally, poison? Originally, yes. OK. And, and what about that green and amber, on. then? Um, they just came along later. Um, a lot of the glass companies just diverted into what, what they probably thought, well, the main thing is the shape, okay. so colour Well, what do you, you know, show us, show us something stonking. Well, probably the classic uh, English poison bottle is the uh, coffin. The shape of a coffin? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. shape of a coffin. <laughs> Can't get much more macabre than that. That was patented by Langford in 1871. Okay. Very rare. There's only about six known worldwide, and half of those are damaged. Yeah, there's the nutter in you coming in. Yeah. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Um, um, oh, I'll lay that down. And what about bit... the skull? Now, the skull, that was, that's an American. That's the only American bottle I've got in the collection. The rest but of these are English? The rest are English, yeah. Well, generally speaking... In the drawer out, it's actually easier for oh. maintenance. Right. So they were thinking not only for them, but for the people going to use the piece of furniture. And of course, it's stamped here, Gillows, Lancaster. Yes. They were leading cabinet makers in Lancaster, but also they were like interior decorators. And when this was put into the music room, the whole room would have been in this fashion, in what we call um, aesthetic period, which is around 1880, 1900s. Mm. Later into the 1900s, Gillows merged with another company and they were called then Waring and Gillow. But this is just before they merged, and so they were just had the brand name Gillows of Lancaster. Right. Because this is aesthetically beautiful, I would put a value on this between three and five thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> oh, three very pretty Dresden Cupids. Are they your collection, have they always been together? Um, I'm not sure if they've always been together. They belong to my mum now, but she got them from her mother-in-law, who died about ten years ago. So I'm not sure where they've come from. Right. Are they your taste? Do you, do, do you like them? No, I think they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'd give them to a charity shop. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, it's a very popular style that's been around for a long time. In, in Dresden, these have been made since the 1750s, and they've carried on being made really for an awful long time. And many homes have liked them. Perhaps the traditions for Cupid's around has waned a little bit. But um, actually, these are... I quite like some of these, but they're rather different. Which do you think is the best of them? Do you have a um, preferences? No, I think they're all horrible, but probably <laughs> yeah. that one I would prefer. Right. I mean, what we need to look at these is who made them and when, and really how well they're made. Yeah. And looking at that one, it's Cupid in disguise. Oh. Cupid there is dressed up as a little girl with a fan. Yeah. And we look at the amount of detail in the way the faces are painted. It's actually not terribly well done on this one. Oh. Um, this one isn't a good one. <laughs> so, 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 so having got that one out of the way, yeah. there's the mark on the bottom is two lines and a cross. Yeah. It looks like the Dresden sign, yeah. but it's a copy. Oh. This was made in probably about 1900 in Sitzendorf, yeah. a town near Dresden, but isn't the real thing. Oh. But it's copying this one. Yeah. This is Meissen. Meissen's the great factory in Dresden. Yeah. And when you look at the way it's painted, there's a lot more detail there. And the scroll work on the base is so much more precise. Oh, it's yes. just that much better. Yeah. And the mark, very proudly, the cross swords of the Meissen factory. And that's the, that's the mark we always like to suit, 600 pounds. <laughs> and here we've got um, just that much older, yeah. mid 18th century, Meissen at its best. Yeah. So, in spite of the damage, we're looking at £1,500 for that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe I like that one best. That's <laughs> not bad. So, so, over £2,000 wow. worth of figures. Yeah. But this is the one to treasure. Yeah, and to be careful with on the way home. <laughs> Thank you. Take a look at this toothsome trio here. They may not be the most attractive objects I've ever seen on the Antiques Roadshow, I have to be honest, but they're certainly among the most popular. 
Toby jugs. And this week's basic Better Best Challenge is set by our ceramic specialist, Henry Sandon, who is a great devotee of Toby jugs. And he's brought three along today. One is worth £50, one is worth £700, and the best one is worth £1,400. Can you tell which is which? Let's see what our visitors think. Basic for the guy with the brown coat because he seems a little bit more dull and not as like nice looking. <laughs> and then better for the guy in the blue and then best for the guy with the green coat. With the attractive spots on his face. That's right. Would you fancy owning something like that in your home? No. <laughs> it's not trendy enough. <laughs> the handle on that one is better finished than the other two, so I'll put that as best. Basic, better, best. And he's best because? He just looks older. His teeth looks a bit sort of shabby and just looks like a good dentist. No, I'll go with him. I like his nose as well. So you like his bad teeth and his sort of beak-like nose. nose? Yes. Is that what you like in a man? Well, like in a in a Toby Jack, not so much in a man, but in a Toby Jack. <laughs> that is the best. And that is better. Okay, and why do you think this is the best one? Uh, blue is my favourite colour. Is that really the only reason? <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> it's just so arbitrary, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God for Henry Sandon. At least he knows what he's talking about. Now, I detected an Australian accent when I first met you. Yes. What's the connection between an Australian and the famous English sea captain? Well, I'm the great-great-nephew of Captain John Vine Hall, and Captain John Vine Hall was the captain on the maiden voyage of the Great Eastern Steamship. Fantastic. Perhaps one of the most iconic of all English ships of that period. And indeed, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's third shipbuilding masterpiece. Yes. And I mean, just look at this period print. And it's not called Leviathan for nothing. Correct. It actually says the name of uh, an important Russian jeweller. But I'd just like to discuss um, this in, in a back to front way and tell you about the eggs, which are sky blue enameled Easter yes. eggs on a necklace. And they're surmounted by tiny, tiny diamond laurels and that's quite important in a way because in the tradition of uh, jewellery the colour blue is for love and it's something borrowed something blue mm, yeah. and here we have it conspicuously written but above it we also see tiny laurels set with diamonds and this is a visual rebus for um, a Latin phrase which is omnia vincit amor, the triumph of love overall. So here is the, the triumphal laurels um, surmounting the colour blue. But there's also another message coming across here because they are Easter eggs. This is a gift from somebody at Easter in Holy Russia to present to somebody that they love. And, and it's the triumph of love over everything. Um, I think it is a triumph because it survived. It's in absolutely pristine condition, which is wonderful for all kinds of good reasons but let's return to the lid satin once again and it says quite plainly K Fabergé mm -hmm. Moscow oh gracious <laughs> oh wonderful and we don't need any explanation beyond that to know no. that this is by far the most um, famous goldsmith's workshop that's ever existed so it's very, very exciting yes. stuff. Oh, right. What are the uh, blue bubbles? What are they? They're made of a silver core, which has been engraved, and then flooded with blue enamel. And you're seeing through the um, enamel onto the engraved ground. Oh, I see. And there's a great tradition in Russia to give Easter eggs. In the country, you'd have painted white chicken's eggs yeah. to give. And in the towns, there would be wooden eggs, perhaps ceramic eggs. But in this curious claustrophobic world of the Romanov court and its orbit, um, only Fabergé would do. Mm. This is a whiff of pre-revolutionary oh, Russia. Wonderful. And in 1917, catastrophe happened because mm -hmm. the Russian Revolution came about. Yeah. And Fabergé's empire was destroyed utterly and completely and forever. And so when we see these things coming through, the excitement mounts enormously. And mercifully, your friend has taken enormous care with it because it's almost perfect condition and it's kept within this box which signs it. It's like a picture frame. And your friend has an object which is undoubtedly worth £12,000. Oh, my goodness. Oh, she'd be thrilled to peace. Oh, because quite recently she had a big fire at her, her house 
and uh, there's quite a lot of things lost and this was one thing that survived. Well that's wonderful and it may yeah. be some small compensation yeah. but how exciting to see it here today. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful. She'd be thrilled to pieces. I'm thrilled to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, I'm exhausted now. I don't know about you. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay. If you remember, I was telling you earlier... Probably a good old drink yeah. and a shout. And uh, it's such a bustle, such a lively scene, and you really do get a strong sense of... Uh, and when would it be about, do you think? About um, early 1900s. That's what I think, yes. Or, or perhaps even earlier, yes. actually. And here are the barges, they're loading the coal into Yes. And, and the smoke and the steam, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's very uh, evocative of the busy life that this place yeah. must have once yeah. had. Yeah, oh, yes. Um, when you think of what it used to be like, the Midway years ago, even in my time, it's altered so much. Uh, some because your, your job is on the river? It was on the river, yes. I was skipper of a salvage vessel, Medway Rhino, the voyage and salvage vessel, based at Shannon's Docks. And what were your duties? Uh, all the boys in the Medway and ten parts of the Thames Estuary. And so also... here am I telling you, 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 you must understand the river better than me, far better. So, I mean, is that, would you say that's a fair representation of river life? Yes, I've actually gone round there and got an idea of where it's where he actually took it from. And that was uh, right on the corner of uh, what we call Chatham Ness. And there's a poem on the back. That is uh, a poem from a burial at sea, when you do uh, an ashes at sea. Have you had to do that? I have done it, yes. Um, How does the poem go? It is my sole relief that on some far distant shore, far from despair and grief, old friends shall meet once more. I think that's great, and it obviously means a great deal to you. It's a nice feeling. You know, if you're doing a, someone's ashes, you know, a colleague's ashes at sea um, in the Medway or in the Thames Estuary, um, it's nice to be able to do something, you know. I think that's great. Now, I think it was probably done for one of the magazines, like the graphic or something. It's an illustration, it seems to me. Yeah. It's actually done in watercolour, in one colour, which is, again, it adds to the immediacy. I get the feeling of him standing right there and doing it, just dashing it off, catching it like a snapshot yeah. for an instant, and that's why it feels so real, so immediate, yeah. and, uh, and so very good. Um, how did you get it? Uh, I rescued it from being burnt. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. Uh, they was clearing out uh, some of the offices. And this was uh, ages ago? Or, uh, uh, 40 years ago. Oh, I see, yes. And um, I managed to rescue this one. Well, now, I mean, he's a very sought-after artist. I mean, he actually ran away to sea because the Royal Academy rejected some of his pictures. He thought, yes. forget that, I'm going to sea. And that's, of course, where he learned uh, a great deal more about the sea than he, than he had known. And that's why he came back the better marine artist, I think, yeah. uh, later on. And he is collected. Uh, and I, I particularly like his work, I must say. So I'm delighted to find one. Um, I can't put a huge amount on it simply because it is black and white. No. But I would have thought, I'd be surprised if it wasn't worth four to six hundred pounds. Yeah. Something like that. OK, well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for bringing it. So where exactly did this piece of furniture come from? Uh, it came from 